this video, we are going to be discussing some incredibly serious, horrifying Kabbalah secrets. There's such a lack of understanding about true Kabbalah. I have an expert in Judaism and Kabbalah. His research he has compiled in this is astounding. He has the most knowledge about Kabbalah, I think maybe more than any Gentile of all time, unless there's somebody else out there that I need to be referred to. And it's such a disappointment that so many other people in alt media, so many other people out there that aren't talking about this, aren't talking about Kabbalah. So I appreciate you for being here. Thank you so much. It was a very generous uh, introduction. I hope I can live up to it. So I I've been doing so much reading on related books. Can you think of another expert that's, I mean, besides rabbis, there's hardly ever even really any uh, knowledgeable critics out there that know about Kabbalah. That's that's what I wanted to say in the introduction also. I'm always reading all these other books and they're always vindicating and validating what you're saying and I'm seeing clips of rabbis explaining all these things and, and the fact that you're right about all this. So, you know, so many people, they don't, they hear, they hear the word Kabbalah all the time but they don't actually understand what it means. Like, if you had 20 seconds to explain to somebody, like say you grab the microphone and you're on national television, what would you say about Kabbalah that people need to know? Kabbalah is a system of beliefs which derives from the Orphic mythology of the Greeks, from Gnosticism, from Neo-Pythagoreanism, from Pythagoras, from Plato, from Middle Platonic thought, and from Neoplatonism. And I'm going to start to explain that today. And what that really means is it's a system of beliefs as to how the world was created and as how the world should end. It is a cosmology and an eschatology, which primarily derives from Greek beliefs, but it is twisted in a very negative way to try to justify their pre-existing hatred of Gentiles and their pre-existing desire to exterminate Gentiles. So, an extermination plan of the Gentiles and the plan to rule the world at the end of the 6,000 years, is some of the origins coming from the Canaanite religion as well? Absolutely, yes. It's yeah. all paganism. Mm -hmm. They uh, largely discard the Torah, except that they look at the Torah as an allegory. Uh, there was a Jew named Philo the Jew of Alexandria, Egypt. And at the time that he lived, which is the lifetime of Christ, Alexandria was the largest Jewish community in the world, larger than Jerusalem, much larger. And it housed most of the Jewish intellectuals. And Philo the Jew incorporated uh, Canaanite religion, the oral traditions of the Jews, and Platonic philosophy in an environment where Neo-Pythagoreanism and Middle Platonism were thriving. And he utilized the Torah as an allegory, just as Jacob and Esau represent Jews and Gentiles. He went through the Torah again and again and said that it was an allegory to these Greek ideas. Tohu and Tikkun is vitally important to what I'm going to be discussing today. It's directly to creation and the destruction of the present world that we live in and the creation of the Gentiles and the ultimate destruction, annihilation, genocide of the Gentiles. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I wanted to specifically get into Toho and Bohu, Tukun Olam, and then most importantly, the symbolism of the shells and the husks of the Kelly pot and what that means and, and what that... Uh, symbolism, the implications of that symbolism are for the non-Jews. But to get there, you have to kind of explain like the whole creation story, you know, summarize it at least uh, if you could, Where, wherever you want to start off the top of your head. You have um, an image of the reverse, the backside of a an American dollar bill. Yeah, it's up. Okay. If you look to your left, you'll see a pyramid and the capstone on that pyramid is an eye emanating light. I'm going to go back to the Greeks now and back to Alexandria and this climate where we have Neo-Pythagoreanism 
and Middle Platonism and Philo and explain what all this symbolism means because it relates directly to what you just put up about Tohu, Bohu, and Tikkun Olam. The eye on the top signifies the one, which is known as the monad in Greek and the Ein Sof in Kabbalah. You'll notice that it is emanating rays of light. Those are the emanations of the one which produce being. The remainder of the pyramid is produced by the emanations of those rays of light in a hierarchy of being. Now the one is got several attributes. It is perfect unity, meaning it has no parts. It is not differentiated. It is eternal, meaning that it does not change or exist in temporal time. It is ultimate goodness. It is only good. And it is composed purely of light. And you will notice that this pyramid is made of layers. Those layers represent the emanations that pass from the top towards the bottom. Remember that emanation relates to descent down the hierarchy of being. And in the Greek system, the first thing to descend as an emanation is called nous. And that means mind or intelligence, and it contains the logos and the demiurge. The noose then emanates the world soul. And the world soul, the noose, and the one, they are referred to as the hypostases. The proto-theos is the first god, the one. The deuteros-theos is the second god, or the noose. And then we have the world soul. The important thing to note right now is that as these emanations pass down towards the bottom, they become further and further differentiated into more and more parts. We see that the one is breaking apart and the light of the one is breaking apart and that will ultimately produce sparks. We also should note that the chain of being then passes from the world soul to the uh, lesser gods below it the angels and demons below the lesser gods, and then human beings to animals, to plants, to rocks and minerals. And bear in mind that this is a constant descent getting further and further away from God as the emanations proceed down their chain. At the very bottom, at the foundation, we see what the Greeks referred to as matter. Remember the attributes of God. God is eternal. God is unity. God is good. God is light. God is undivided. He exists in eternal time. Matter is exactly the opposite. Now matter is what the Jews call tohu and bohu in the first paragraph of Genesis. And in the Greek conception, it is a pre-existing substratum, which in and of itself is nothingness, what the Kabbalists would refer to as a non-entity. This matter is pure evil. It is absolute darkness. It is the furthest distance from God that one can get and it is non-being and that is the realm of the Gentiles. So the Jews view themselves as the capstone of the pyramid, as the one, and they view Gentiles as matter, as non-being, pure darkness, pure evil, ever-changing, and they believe that they can use a kind of a black magic on Gentiles to completely convert them into this matter of nothingness and thereby make them cease to exist. Kabbalah is based almost entirely on this Neo-Platonic conception that the One emanates its light and that those emanations 
continue down the chain of the sephirot, you can see that the um, on the tree of life, those lines going between the sephirah, from Keter to Chokhmah to Benah, etc., all the way down to Melkut. And that is the descent of the emanations. Now remember that this descent makes things more divided, more changing, more evil, and further from God. There is an opposite route that goes back up to God. And that is the route which the Greeks refer to as epistrophe. An epistrophe is descent. Now in uh, Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 through 19, it discusses Jacob's ladder. Now as I said, Kabbalah takes the stories of the Old Testament and of the Torah specifically as allegories. And this allegory of Jacob's ladder is the ascent of the angels up and down the ladder to the gates of heaven, as well as the descent down the ladder to the gates of hell. And you'll notice in this picture, again, we have the one as a body of light like the sun emanating its rays of light. And as the emanations proceed downwards, they approach the darkness of matter and they start to separate further and further, creating more and more differentiation. And you can see that they break down into sparks and that those sparks become greater in number, less significant and more shrouded in evil darkness as we proceed toward the base of the hierarchy of being. Now the Kabbalists view themselves as wanting to engage in epistrophe. They want the ascent up the ladder towards the one. And Kabbalists practice the old ancient belief of the mystics and in mysticism that there can be an ecstatic reunion with the one. That ecstatic reunion with the one means that the Kabbalists utilize knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to elevate themselves up the ladder, the great chain of being, as it's called, the hierarchy of being. And by doing that, they lose their sense of self. It is referred to as the death of the ego and they become one with the one, not separated from it, not differentiated, not temporal and changing, but the perfection of the one that they refer to as the Ein Sof. And the mystics said that that was an ecstatic um, transcendence that one experiences when they ascend the hierarchy of being through epistrophe, and that is the opposite of emanation. Instead of the light being projected downwards from the one, the Ein Sof, it is the light returning back to its origin, back to the one, so it forms a cycle. And then it becomes what uh, Aristotle referred to as the final cause. It would be the goal of the emanation to ultimately return through epistrophe to the one so that the many are returning to their source. Now, if we go back to the dollar bill, would that be possible? Yes. There's a lot of symbolism there that uh, we can now understand better. If you can go over to the pyramid, at the base of the pyramid, you'll see that it says 1776 in uh, Roman numerals. It utilizes Roman numerals because that signifies gematria, because the letters are also numbers, which is the basis of gematria. Anuit Kerptus is composed of 12 letters, signifying the 12 signs of the zodiac and the 12 tribes of Israel and Judah. The um, Novus Ordo Seclorum 
is new world order and signifies the world to come. In the world to come, the Jews will have elevated the earth along the hierarchy of being to equal what is in heaven, the throne of God on the seventh heaven on the planet Saturn. So they are going to be making the earth like the planet Saturn. And the method that they will use to do that is to destroy matter and destroy the Gentiles. And I'll get into that in a bit with the shattering of the vessels and how this Greek conception of the hierarchy of being uh, is mutated through Kabbalah into a plan to exterminate Gentiles. If you go over to the part with the eagle and the stars, I can explain that symbolism and how it relates to our story. You'll see above the eagle that there are 13 stars. Again, when stars are differentiated like that, it represents the sparks of Kabbalah, the emanations as they proceed down the chain of being and become further and further differentiated and further, further enshrouded in darkness in the shells and husks of the darkness of chaotic matter. Remember that matter is tohu and bohu of Genesis. You'll see that those stars are arranged in the pattern of the star of David with a star in the center. That star in the center represents the temple in Jerusalem. And the Jews believe that there are six directions or dimensions, north, south, east, west, above and below. And the Star of David signifies that. But the Star of David is initially the Star of Remphan, and it signifies the planet Saturn. E pluribus unum means out of many one. Now you will recall as we descend, as we emanate from the one down the hierarchy of being, the beings become more differentiated more particular. They are no longer unity. And at the base of matter, they are infinite. So what this is symbolizing is taking that many, which are the Jews, and restoring them to the unity of the one, which is the Ein Sof. And that is what the Kabbalistic symbolism on the back of the dollar signifies. And it's a good introduction to uh, Kabbalah. And it was Freemasons that put this on the dollar bill, and Freemasonry is based upon Kabbalah and Temple of Solomon and basically Judaism, Judaism themes. If you can get that image, uh, William Blake's painting of Jacob's Ladder again. So again, we see the one emanating light. Going down the hierarchy is emanation. Going up the hierarchy is epistrophe, rising. E. Michael Jones would refer to it as the rising of the Logos. That means that the little seeds of the Logos, which contains the divine plan and the forms in the form of Logoi Spermatikoi, which means seeds of the Logos, go down. Now, the way that this is explained uh, in Kabbalah from its roots in Greek philosophy is that as the emanations of light project their light onto the blank substratum which is chaos and void the matter referred to as tohu and bohu at the very bottom rung of the chain of being those forms which exist as ideal forms in the noose in the mind of God which is the first emanation those little seeds come down and give forms that we can perceive that chaotic matter. Now in Kabbalah, those forms take the form of Jews having different souls from Gentiles. Jews have those little sparks, the Logoi Spermatikoi, within their souls. Their souls contain those sparks of divine light as the differentiated emanations of the Ein Sof. 
But in Gentiles, those sparks are not contained in their souls. They simply loosely hover over the Gentiles so that the form of the Gentile exists as a phantasm, as a non-being in that chaotic matter. And that is why the Zohar refers to Gentiles as tohu and bohu. It means that they are simply reflected shadows and forms that are caused by these sparks of the emanation, but do not contain these sparks. That means that if the Kabbalah through the process of tikkun olam can raise those sparks, which hover over the Gentiles, they will free that light and then epistrophe will occur and the light will elevate up the chain of being, up the hierarchy of being and escape from the Gentiles who are shells of darkness and who are purely evil. When that happens, those sparks which gave form and existence to Gentiles will no longer be in the realm of chaos and void, tohu and bohu. Therefore, the Gentile whose spark is elevated will cease to exist and will resolve back into nothingness. Matter is nothingness. It is pure evil. Now, Adam found some quotes from uh, Schnort Salman and Josef Yitzhak Schneerson that he asked me to analyze. And this is the basis upon which we should analyze those quotes. Because Schneerson, who was the sixth Rebbe, utilized his Kabbalistic black magic to defeat Gentiles by resolving them back into non-entities. And if we read the precise quotes, we will see that what he is referring to is taking the divine sparks away from Gentiles so that their matter, their tohu and bohu, resolves back into nothingness because Gentiles are what he calls non-entities. What Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, who forms the basis of Kabbalah, would call nothingness, matter. So this is from a book, someone sent me this on Twitter, An End to Evil, Reshis Goyim Amalek, which interesting that, you know, they're saying Amalek is Goyim and they're all evil. The first Hasidic discourse, this was delivered in 1920 by the seventh and final Rebbe Schneerson, right? It was the father or the, the father-in-law of Schneerson, uh, Rebbe Schneerson, the seventh. Father-in-law. Father-in-law. Father-in-law, yeah. So what he says here. He says, Amalek is the first among the nations, and in the end, he shall be destroyed. The root of the seven evil nations. And uh, he, they're, they're separate from. It says, the same is also true, though keeping in mind <clears throat> the distinction between holiness and its opposite, with the or the other side on the tree of life, with regard to the forces of unholiness, which are collectively termed helipa. Amalek per, per personifying the toughest Kalipa is the spiritual source and root of all the nations, yet he is distinct from them. So they, all the nations, they say, are basically Amalek or Edom. The conclusion of the above verse, and in the end he shall be destroyed, seem to, seems to imply that the Kalipa of Amalek contains no element that can be salvaged by means of the divine service called Beririum, the sifting and refining of the material by elevating the divine sparks embedded within within it. The Kalipa of Amalek, so it would appear, cannot be rehabilitated into something positive and thereby brought to a state of rectification, tikkun. Rather, the only rectification of Amalek is its utter eradication and destruction. This is hinted at in the verse, and in the end he shall be destroyed. Amalek's consummation is its destruction comments what's that what that is saying remember tikkun is the ascent up the ladder of the hierarchy of being so by raising the sparks you are now depriving matter chaos of those sparks 
So it is the end of Gentiles because the, um, the ideal forms will no longer be presented to matter. So the creation of the Gentiles will be destroyed. And the end times and tikkun is the process, the inversion of emanation. It is ascending the ladder and not descending the ladder. And in that uh, story of Jacob's ladder, the angels are ascending and descending. Descending is falling. So what the Rebbe is calling for is for Gentiles to continue to fall until they are eradicated. While at the same time, the earth and the Jews are raised up, ascend the ladder towards the source of the light and become rectified and redeemed in that process as Gentiles are destroyed in that process. And it says that it, they are uh, non-entities in here as well. That is a reference to Gentiles as being what the Greeks called matter, nothingness. Now let's start to get into uh, the cosmology of Kabbalah, and then we'll end up at the eschatology of, cosm of uh, Kabbalah. So we're going to get into the creation myth. And in that cosmology, again, it mirrors the Greeks, that there was a pre-existing chaos and void, which is called tohu and bohu in the Torah. Now, this is a system of pantheism in both the Greek and Kabbalah, because what happens is the Ein Sof, which is the one in the Greek, in the Kabbalistic system contracts itself. Remember that it is perfect unity, light, eternity, undifferentiated. So in order to create beings, there has to become the particular. There has to become differentiation, a multitude of things. And there has to be a space and a time in which these things can take form and in which they can change. Because again, the one is eternal. There is no change within it. So the Ein Sof, as its first act of love, contracts itself. And this creates an emptiness, a chaos and a void into which it then emanates the first emanation of the tree of life, Keter, Adam Kadmon. And this emanation of light then projects its light to the next emanation, Chokhmah, which then projects its light to Bana and so on, all the way down. And it, as it descends, it gets further and further from God. But the Kabbalistic system deviates a little bit from Plotinus' system at this point. And this is all an innovation by Isaac Luria, which is most certainly based on Neoplatonism and the emanation theories of the Gnostics, of the uh, Neo-Pythagoreans, and of the uh, Middle and Neoplatonics. Now, what Luria said, so that he could get around this idea of this pre-existing chaos, which exists in Genesis and which mirrors the Greek, especially in, um, in Plato's Timaeus, uh, which is the substratum of matter, which is purely evil and um, has no forms until the demiurge takes the forms from the mind of the one and uh, imposes them as light on this darkness to give them forms. Think of it this way. If you take a light and you shine it on this primordial matter, which is chaos, these ideal forms which exist in the mind of God take on somewhat corrupted and less ideal forms, but they become something in this darkness and they turn non-being into being. But if you remove the light, that immediately again returns to darkness. And that's what the Jews want to do to Gentiles. They want to turn off the light that was turned on to this chaotic darkness and restore it back to chaotic darkness for Gentiles. Well, they themselves 
elevate their sparks back towards higher levels of this emanation. And they also want to lift the world up the level of being so that it matches the seventh heaven and the throne of God on the planet Saturn. So that is why Takun Olam is always talking about elevating the sparks and releasing the divine sparks from the darkness. This is all Greek cosmology. And what they are doing is now they are saying the end times are approaching. So we have to reverse the process of emanation. For the Kabbalists, the angels are no longer going to be walking down Jacob's ladder. They are going to be ascending Jacob's ladder. Now there is a bridge that exists in Kabbalah, which also existed in Plato's Timaeus. Plato called it the great divide between the divine realm where the one and the noose existed and then the lower realms of the gods and created beings and the intermediary beings going down towards matter. Jacob's ladder is considered a bridge that crosses this great divide. And in Kabbalah, there is a hidden 11th Sephirah known as Dayat. And Dayat means knowledge. So the Kabbalists believe that with knowledge, they can cross over this bridge from the lower seven emanations into the higher three emanations. So we have out of the many returning to the one. And that's vitally important to understand. And again, we have to look to the Torah as an allegory in the Torah in the book of Genesis, it states that in the Garden of Eden, Yahweh forbid Adam to eat of the tree of knowledge. And the gods did this because they were afraid that if Adam ate of knowledge, he would be able to use knowledge, Deat, as a bridge across the great divide and therefore ascend up the chain of being and become one of the gods. So the gods were afraid that knowledge can enable human beings who are intermediary beings and lower beings to ascend and become higher beings to become gods. And one of the attributes of gods is that they are eternal. So knowledge becomes the tree of life and the Torah is the source of this knowledge and the Torah is referred to by Kabbalists as the tree of life. And you would think that it would be called the tree of knowledge, but it's not because knowledge creates divinity and causes one to ascend the hierarchy of being so that it thereby becomes the tree of life. So this is vitally important to understanding the Kabbalistic agenda, because just as the gods tried to prevent mankind from uh, eating of knowledge and gaining dayat so it could cross the bridge over the great divide between the realm of the divine and the realm of the mundane, the Kabbalists tried to prevent Gentiles from gaining knowledge because Just as Adam was punished with death when he ate or when Eve was tempted and grabbed the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the Kabbalists condemn Gentiles to death for gaining knowledge. In the Babylonian Talmud, folio 59a, which states that any Gentile who gets the knowledge of the Torah deserves death. So again, the Jews are constantly modeling themselves allegorically after what their gods do and the story of the Garden of Eden and forbidding the Gentiles from gaining knowledge drives the Gentiles down the Jacob's ladder towards matter, towards becoming nothingness without knowledge because that knowledge also helps to create their form. So if they are deprived of knowledge, they will descend down into nothingness. 
if the Kabbalists consume knowledge and safeguard knowledge just as their gods did, then they will ascend Jacob's ladder and return to the first one emanating all of the light. This story is repeated in the story of the Tower of Babel. Again, the Tower of Babel is ascending towards a higher state of being and entering into the uh, realm of the One. It becomes Jacob's Ladder, allowing uh, all of humanity to ascend to the gods and cross over the Great Divide. It becomes the bridge, the Deat of knowledge. And this, just as it scared the gods that uh, human beings should obtain knowledge, it scared the gods that these human beings bearing axes were going to climb into heaven and become gods and idol worshippers at the peak, at the top of the Tower of Babel. This is very important to understand because uh, we are being persecuted in the exact same way allegorically. Because what the gods did to prevent this unity of humanity at the time all human beings spoke the same language which means that they shared their knowledge and they were able to pass along knowledge to one another and to their children so that knowledge would not have to be regained in every generation in other words they were allowed to progress up the hierarchy of being, up the chain of being to become gods. And that scared the gods. So what the gods did was they shattered the Tower of Babel, shattered all the knowledge and lowered human beings down the chain of being back into the realm of matter and material. And at the same time, they made every human being speak a different language so that there could be absolutely no unity among human beings. Remember, unity is an attribute of the one. So they differentiated human beings, stripped them of their knowledge, and stripped them of their ability to communicate with one another and share their knowledge and allow their knowledge to progress, especially from generation to generation. So the Tower of Babel is actually a a repetition of the story of the Garden of Eden, uh, conveying the exact same lessons to the Jews. Now the Jews view themselves as gods of the earth, just as Yahweh and Shekinah are gods of the heavens. And they want to make the earth as above, so below, and they want to perfect the earth so that the earth rises up the chain of being to heaven. In order to do this, what they do is they atomize Gentiles. They pit Gentiles against one another, which is the same lesson as the Tower of Babel, of creating different languages. And they do this on the internet by creating echo chambers. These echo chambers are the exact same process as the Tower of Babel where everyone has the potential to speak one language on the internet, they start to ban certain forms of speech and they um, create echo chambers where people searching for information get fed directly back into the same cycle of information that their group is permitted to engage in, but they are not allowed to communicate with others. And this is the process of the Tower of Babel, of differentiating the Gentiles to make them more like evil matter and drive them down the chain of being away from the unity of the One. I have a question. Where did you uh, read about these things? The Dollar Bill and the Tower of Babel? Um, there was a book uh, that I read just recently that was written by I think Pharrell and DeHart called Transhumanism and that book um, I think they got the chain of being wrong they inversed it and they think the lowest level is the highest level and they made several other mistakes but it talked about the Tower of Babel and the fact that the Tower of Babel 
leads into plurality and the division of the one and is utilized by the gods as a means of keeping human beings from progressing. In terms of the dollar bill, those are all my unique insights as far as I know. But it became immediately apparent to me when I um, thoroughly came to understand and read Plotinus's Aeneids. Plotinus wrote uh, six books in the form of nine tractates each. Aeneid means the nines. And in this, Plotinus lays out his um, theories of the hierarchy of being and of the trinity of the one, the noose, and the world soul. And when I pieced that together and I considered Plotinus's conception of matter as nothingness and matter as pure evil, the furthest distant thing from God on the chain of being to the point where it becomes non-being, it all clicked for me. And now I should explain the cosmology of the emanations. So as I said, the Ein Sof contracted itself to create a space for differentiation, for particular things, for a plenitude, a multitude of things to exist and in which they could uh, change in space and time and reorder themselves. <clears throat> that vacuum that he created is referred to as the Tsim Tsum. And he then projects an emanation of himself into that Tsim Tsum that becomes the Adam Kadmon and the Sephirotic Tree of Life. These emanations are of powerful, um, divine, radiant light. And Isaac Luria introduced matter, the Greek matter, the pure evil into his system in the form of vessels, which contained this radiant light in the 10 sephirah that become the sephirot. So that um, these vessels form a shell a husk, a container for this light. And the top three containers held, but the lower seven containers, which are the lower seven sephirot on the tree of life, shattered. And when these uh, lower seven vessels shattered, they formed the tohu and bohu, which is the primordial chaotic matter of the Greeks and it was only the sparks of the divine light which scattered when the seven vessels shattered that give any kind of intelligible form to these um, shattered uh, shards the supernal refuse as it's called this garbage of pure evil the Gentiles remain this garbage of the pure evil. The Jews are the divine sparks and they can free themselves and enter a higher realm of being, but the Gentiles cannot. Because if the Gentiles free the sparks that are attached to them, they descend in back into uh, Tohu and Bohu and become the matter of non-being and nothingness. Now the Jews, I think in Shabbat, in the Babylonian Talmud, Folio Shabbat, um, Folio 88a or 88b, I think it is, state that as long as there is a single Jew alive who studies the Torah, the state of being of the universe will continue to exist. But if every Jew were to abandon the Torah, then all of the knowledge would be lost and the entire world would dissolve and resolve back into tohu and bohu and become nothingness. So that is why the Kabbalists view it as vitally important that they become Jacob in the tents studying the Torah 
Well, Esau is the animal, the darkness, the shells, the caliphot, out in the fields providing the means for sustenance for the Kabbalists to engage in this Torah study. So all of these Greek ideas are utilized as a justification for their pre-existing hatred of Gentiles and their belittlement of Gentiles because they place Gentiles on the lowest rung of the ladder of being and they place themselves on the highest rung of the ladder of being as polar opposites. They are the light, they are goodness, they are eternal, they will inherit the world to come. Gentiles are exactly the opposite. Gentiles are pure evil, Gentiles are pure darkness, Gentiles are temporal as opposed to eternal and will cease to exist. And the world to come can only be created by removing the darkness from the present world and elevating the state of being of the present world to the heavenly world. And that entails killing off the Gentiles. Just wanted to uh, show something real quick here. This is the, the Megala 6a, it's the Talmud. It says, es God said to him, Esau is wicked. Isaac said to God, yet will he not learn righteousness? It, just like we read earlier, can Amalek be rehabilitated? They say, there is no one who can find merit in him. God said to him, in the land of uprightness, he will deal wrongfully. So he, he will be, he'll be an idol worshiper in the world to come and that's not allowed meaning that he is destined to destroy Israel. Isaac said to God, if that is so, that he is that wicked, he will not behold the majesty of the Lord. This concept that, that Esau hates Jacob, we are genetically predisposed to anti-Semitism because we're jealous and mad that, that they stole the birthright. So they believe that, and then at the same time, they also Wait, teach in the I Talmud. Can a few insights into that last passage? Because yes, I think it's significant. Yes. Well, if you go can ahead. back up and show it, he will not behold the majesty of the Lord. That is the ecstatic reunion with the one that the mystics had long before Talmud and Kabbalah came into existence. That is elevation. That is epistrophe, ascent up the to the higher planes and up to this ecstatic reunion with God. Now, Esau cannot rise up the ladder of being. He has to descend because he is composed only of material. In theology, we have three basic theories in Christianity and Judaism, Gnosticism, <coughs> excuse me, and Platonic thought. We have creation ex materia which means that creation is made out of the pre-existing uh, chaotic substance of darkness, which is matter. We have creation ex Deo, which means creation from God, which is the emanation theory that God projects its divine light and these sparks of light become the Jewish beings. That is pantheism. And then in Christianity, which orthodox, not Gnostic, Gnostic Christianity remain, retains the dualism of ex materia and um, ex deo. But in orthodox Christianity, we have something new, which is creation ex nihilo which avoids the pantheism of Kabbalah and uh, Gnosticism. And in ex nihilo, God does not create the universe from itself as it does with emanation theories. It simply creates it from nothing. So there is not this chaotic pre-existing matter. But the uh, Neo-Pythagoreans of uh, the first century BC to about the second century BC, and they stated that matter is pure evil. And that is the justification that the Jews use for claiming that Esau is pure evil. Because Esau is flesh? How, are they, how is Esau, Esau flesh, is but flesh. they're not? Esau is composed ex materia from the original pre-existing chaos of Tohu and Bohu. 
And, and this is interesting because they're also relating here in the Talmud Esau to Germania, which they believe that, that that's what they believed with um, Germany must perish, is that if they don't eliminate Germany, which they believed was Amalek, they pinned as Amalek, then uh, they will go on to destroy the world. So. Right. The world will resolve back into Tohu and Bohu. If the Gentiles continue to exist past this 6,000 year limitation the Kabbalists have imposed on themselves to complete the work of Tikkun Olam, of restoring the Holy One. Do you see how it says, Isaac said before the Holy One? Mm -hmm. That equates to the One, the Monad of the Greeks. So they become elevated. Again, we are going from the particular towards the ultimate unity. It is the experience of losing oneself, the death of the ego, abandoning the conception that human Jewish souls are separate. They believe that all of their souls come from what the Greeks called the world soul, which they call um, Shekinah. That is why we see all these um, new age philosophical systems trying to tell us that we are all one soul and we should unite. That is the root of all these Kabbalistic beliefs is the Greek conception of the world soul that creates the finite soul and that we have to be selfless and abandon our sense of individuality and differentiation so that we can experience the orgasmic, ecstatic experiencing of the loss of self and becoming one with the one. And um, can, what does it mean to be cut off and, and the world to come and the shells of darkness? Can you get in a little bit more of that? How is the shells of darkness story meaning the elimination of the Gentiles? The shells of darkness were formed when those 10 vessels were created by the Ein Sof to contain the powerful radiating light of the emanations. The lower seven of those vessels shattered and they created the materia, matter. They created what Kabbalah refers to as kelephot or um, klipot. Those are the shells. That is the chaotic matter, which is pure darkness, the exact opposite of the one, the holy one. It is pure darkness. It is temporal. It is ephemeral. It is constantly changing. And it only takes form when the uh, emanations of the divine sparks shine upon it. But in taking form, it forms shells, husks, which hide the ideal forms and therefore corrupt them and introduce evil to them. So it is the mission of the Jews to separate these divine sparks from the shattered vessels, which uh, turned into shells and husks concealing these divine sparks and freeing these divine sparks so that they can be elevated and climb up Jacob's ladder towards the gates of heaven. It is the process of creating the ascent. And we have to look at this as a constant cyclical flow. They are constantly driving the Gentiles down because they believe that the Gentiles are demons and shells. They are driving it down uh, the chain of being, the hierarchy of being, towards raw matter. Well, they are lifting the um, Kabbalists up the chain of being by freeing the sparks from this matter. And in terms of Greek thought, what they're doing is freeing uh, the emanation through allowing it to have knowledge and allowing it to have wisdom and understanding which elevates the light back to its source. And they drive the Gentiles down by depriving them of knowledge and this light. 
they are also doing this with transhumanism. And that is, they are feeding us corrupted foods to drive us down the hierarchy of being to become mineral. And they are doing this first by veganism to keep us from eating meat. Recall that the next uh, level down in the hierarchy of being from human beings is animals. So they want to keep us from eating animals and you are what you eat. So they are practicing alchemy and spiritual alchemy against Gentiles and driving them down so that when the Gentile d diet is deprived of meat, Gentiles descend further down the hierarchy of being towards absolute darkness. They next have corrupted plants with GMOs and fertilizers, which are composed of minerals. So they are now turning plant matter into mineral matter, which drives us further down the chain of being and which corrupts our food source and is driving human beings down the uh, hierarchy of being into minerals. And they are also making meat out of plants, which has been made out of these minerals and which has been genetically modified, which has changed its mineral structure. So all of these attacks on the Gentiles are meant to lower the status of our being down the hierarchy of being into becoming the purity of the Kelephot, which is darkness, and at the same time removing any trace of the light that shines from the sparks that hover above us from us so that we become uh, nothingness. And that is what the Rebbe is referring to when he says that Gentiles are non-entities. And what he's really saying is that the forms of Gentiles are only phantasms, are only ghosts which appear to the Jews but are not real being. And they only appear to the Jews because there are lingering sparks of um, the emanations that are shining on these shells of material, of matter, of darkness. And that if the Jews can elevate those sparks of light through the process of tikkun olam, they can remove that light that is shining on the matter and thereby get rid of these ghosts, these evil spirits that are Gentiles. And Gentiles will just disappear. But in terms of practical Kabbalah, which is like practical magic. They are utilizing their knowledge, their science to do all these things. And the attack is taking the form of the attack of corrupting the diet and the genetics of human beings to make human beings into minerals, which is the lowest level of the chain of being. And they also do this with transhumanism by uh, taking away natural childbirth and creating hybrid cyborg organisms. They are going to combine um, organic matter with silicon matter and with computer chips and things into a new form of being which has no independent will, which has no soul, which has no divine spark of the soul. And remember that the world soul is the third emanation in the divine realm, and it creates the finite souls. So what they are again doing is stripping Gentiles of the emanations of light and driving them down the chain of being into becoming programmable minerals. So what they are doing is forcing uh, genetic, the DNA of Gentiles to be combined with machines into cyborgs, which they will say are now superior, but which will be um, programmable and integrated into the singularity. And through the singularity, they will be able to program all of these cyborg robots. And that is the ultimate form that the darkness of the Gentile Esau will become. It will become these robotic slaves of the Kabbalists, and they will have sex slaves. 
They will have work slaves, etc., etc. They will even have slaves who um, utilize their heightened intelligence through integrated computer systems within their being, which will have no soul and have no independent will to uh, figure out better ways of destroying the Gentiles and performing tikkun olam. It will become an ever escalating, like the birth pangs, an ever escalating series of catastrophes for Gentiles, which in, <clears throat> excuse me, which in turn elevates the Jews. You mentioned science. It doesn't the Vilna of, is it Vilna of Gaon? Is that how you say it? Gaon. It Gaon. Means genius. It's genius. Uh, Hebrew for genius. Didn't he say that um, something about like the 600 or the 999 steps to Moshiach will be Moshiach ben Yosef of science or something like that? Yes, it's all um, Moshiach ben Yosef will take the form of science, which again is the idea that knowledge makes human beings like the gods and elevates them up the chain of being. This is already enabling the Kabbalists to breed um, their 600,000 twin souls in new androgynous bodies. The Jews believe that Adam Ahelion, their Adam, which is different from Adam Belial, which is the material satanic um, Samael and Satan, creator of the Gentiles, they have God as their creator and they are uh, the result of the emanations of the light. They believe that there were 600,000 souls in Adam that composed all of the souls of the Jews. Now this is repeated in the Torah in many places, especially in the story of the Exodus, where Moses takes 600 Jewish males out of Egypt. Those 600 Jewish males that he took out of Egypt are the half souls of the 600,000 Jewish twin souls that were contained in Adam. The Jews believe that they have to return themselves to androgynes because they believe that the unity, remember the one, the unity is perfection, is only attained when male and female are one in one androgynous form. And in their gods, that takes the form of the reuniting of the male god Yahweh with the female goddess Shekinah in the temple when they will have sex again when the temple is rebuilt and these 600,000 Jews are restored to Israel. This is vitally important for people to understand, especially Jews at this point, because those 600,000 are all going to be produced out of men. The Kabbalists have figured out ways of turning skin cells into eggs and they are going to make eggs out of Jewish men and then take Jewish men's sperm to create these androgynous beings in laboratories. And they already have the technology to do this. They've already created, um, they have created artificial wombs and artificial means of generating human beings out of the skin cells. And this can potentially be done from a single male. They view the Messiah as being the representation of Adam, and the Messiah contains within him all the 600,000 souls of the Jews. So it is possible that Kabbalists are going to completely exterminate all of humanity, including every single Jew except the Messiah, and then they are going to create their immortal, transhuman 600,000 Jews out of the cells of a single Jewish male who will be the Jewish Messiah. And that's also very similar to the story of Noah, where Noah's family created the entire population of humanity. And I suspect that's exactly where this is headed. And the Jews had better take note of this and take it as seriously as the Gentiles, because this is where it's headed. They want to eliminate all of humanity except for 600,000 androgynous abominations that they are going to use to populate the nation of Israel. These 600,000 abominations will be composed either of 600,000 Jewish males or of a single Jewish male, and no DNA from Jewish females will be utilized in the process. 
So Jews better think over that. If you think you are going to survive into a new world where you will have this glorious utopia and reign over 2,800 uh, Gentile slaves, you are sadly mistaken. They are going to kill you as well. And another little bit of information I'd like to give to the Jewish community, especially the Kabbalists who are plotting the destruction of the Gentiles, is the fact that I don't think any of the Ashkenazi Jews are going to be included in these 600,000 Jews. Even if they decide to make 600,000 uh, Jewish souls out of 600,000 Jewish males, those 600,000 Jewish males are all going to be from the Sephardim. They are not going to tolerate any convert blood. But isn't this Chabad belief? And aren't, isn't Chabad largely Ashkenazi? Yes, Chabad is heading itself into a trap. I'm certain of it. The trap of who? The trap of the Sephardim. The Sephardi Kabbalists? Absolutely, yes. The Sephardic Kabbalists who formed the Dernme and followed Shabbatai Tsevi were always opposed by the Gaon of Vilna, who represented the Mishnagdom. And the Hasidic Jews were duped into becoming the Frankists of the Shabbatai Tsevi movement, the Jews of Poland and Galicia, etc., and um, Romania and that whole area. The Ashkenazi Jews were duped into becoming Zoharites and abandoning the Torah and uh, doing the exact opposite of the Torah by the Sephardic Jews of the uh, converts of Shabbatai Tsevi. Now the Gaon of Vilna understood this and he opposed it, but the Gaon of Vilna interpreted Kabbalah in the exact same way that there are 600,000 Jewish souls. That's why the Gaon of Vilna said that Israel has to be founded by 600,000 Jews. But genius that he was, I don't think he ever realized that their ultimate plan was to kill off the Ashkenazim as they did in the Holocaust uh, to some extent in favor of and use the Ashkenazim in the same way they utilize Gentiles to create a future world in which there will only be 600,000 Sephardim. I can't prove all that at this point other than proving it as a logical conclusion based upon the premises a priori. I can't prove it a posteriori. Um, to do that, I'll have to find some document plotting that, or we'll have to wait and see what happens. But based upon the way that they are engineering the technology, which has become the evil serpent and the Moshiach ben Joseph, and uh, the Gaon of Vilnius understand, understood this very well, this is the opening of the gates of wisdom in the year 1840. This is a part of that uh, change in the last 400 years and the 999 steps which proceed, which are described in the Zohar, the rainbow appears with its seven colors. And those seven colors represent the prism of the pure light of the one that separates into the spectrum of the rainbow, the seven colors. That's how we get back to the rainbow of Noah when mankind is recreated through one family. This is a repetition of the same allegorical stories of the Torah over and over again. That is what we're going to see when we get to the eschatology of Kabbalah, the end times. In the end times, we will again see a projection of the white light of the one through the prism of Dayat, through the prism of knowledge, into the spectrum of the seven colors. And that's why we see the Noahide flag, the seven colors of the flag of Noah, represented everywhere because we're going to experience another flood of another kind which will reformulate humanity and it is going to reformulate humanity exclusively into 600,000 androgyne abominations that will be created in laboratories in Israel and they have the technology as we speak now in Israel to do it. Why have they developed this technology and why does it fit exactly with what the Kabbalah state should be, the eschatological end of the world for the world to come? 
I find it difficult to believe it's a coincidence. And Jewish people are under the same threat as Gentiles, especially the Ashkenazim. To play uh, devil's advocate, what would you say to people who claim that, like, this is just, uh, you know, fringe radical rabbis that don't have any power or influence to carry out these, uh, this agenda? I would say that the rabbis carrying out this agenda are most strongly represented by Chabad Lubavitch, which directly controlled through his family, Donald Trump, controlled Vladimir Putin, through his personal rabbi, Aurel Lazar, and control Betna, Bet, Benjamin Netanyahu through his personal connection to the seventh and final Rebbe who was considered the Messiah, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, and through the Likud party, which is controlled by Chabad Lubavitch. So we see that these people control directly the three most important and powerful people in the world for a period of four years. They have no less control over Joe Biden. Similar control through his vice president, whose husband is Jewish and believes in tikkun olam, which is what this is all about, and through a man named Ron Klein, K-L-A-I-N, who is Biden's Kushner. I'd say also that the the top sages and the top rabbis in the Jewish community definitely have some uh, some level of influence over the Jewish billionaires as well that are so influential. Oh, absolutely. The top Jewish bankers are all Kabbalists. The Rothschild family derive from Talmudic scholars and Kabbalists. It is a Kabbalistic agenda. And in what I said before, I also want to point out that it is true that many Jews are not aware of all this and are not participating in all of this. And I am appealing to them to utilize their finances and their power to end all of this. And I am uh, letting them know out of my love for them that this is a plan for their destruction as well as mine and as well as of all the Gentiles. The Jews are going to go down hard in the end times, the same as the Gentiles, all except for these 600,000 androgynes they're going to create. Ed, can you talk a little bit about the 6,000 years of, and the six days of creation and, and what year we're in now and what that means and how, they, how they're prepping for the end times, uh, like the Sabbath and, the, and Shabbos Goyes, a little bit on that, please? Yes. The Jews um, believe that the seven-day week is in fact a representation of 7,000 years. In Psalms it states, or is it Proverbs, it states that um, one day is for the Lord a thousand years. So that they believe that the uh, inception of the creation of Adam starts their calendar. And that the first 2,000 years of their calendar was from um, Adam to Abraham and the age of the patriarchs. And that the next 2,000 years was from Abraham to Jesus, which was the age of Aries. The first age was Taurus, it, uh, the golden calf, the bull, which gives uh, rise to Aries, the, goat, the, uh, the sheep, the ram's horn, and the Jews. That gives way to Pisces, which is the age of Christianity. And in their scheme, um, it's really 2,150 years, I believe, but they calculated it as 2,000 year periods of each of these ages of the zodiac. Remember that the world of the material is created with temporal time, and that temporal time is cyclical, and the zodiac has 12 signs and we run through the zodiacs in this 6,000 year period. This 6,000 year period is the period that begins with the emanations of Adam Kadmon. Um, again, this is all taken by the adepts, the ones who really know Kabbalah. They don't literally think it was the beginning of creation. They see it as an allegory of the beginning of civilization. 
So 6,000 years ago, civilization started. Now, what was the age preceding Taurus? The age preceding Taurus was Gemini, the twins. Who are the twins that existed uh, before civilization? The twins were Jacob and Esau. You have a pre-existing polar opposite of materialistic, evil Gentiles as the twin Esau. And you have the twin Jacob as the divine light, the eternal twin who will survive this 6,000 years. After Pisces, we have the age of Aquarius. Notice that the age of Aquarius is represented on the zodiac as a single man. That single man is Jacob. It is only Jacob who survives the cycle of the zodiac going from Gemini to Aquarius. We see the age of Pisces is the twin fish. The twin fish are Christianity and Judaism molding the age of Pisces to perfect the world by creating an empire that the Gentiles, Christians will create. And at the end of the age of Pisces, which was about the year 2000 on the calendar of Anno Lucis, the Gregorian calendar, uh, on Anno Lucis it's the year 6000, on Gregorian it's the year 2000, but on the Hebrew calendar, which is the calendar that the Gaon of Vilnius, Vilna used to calculate, um, it uh, hasn't happened yet. We're not yet to the Hebrew year 6000. 5781, so there's only if these guys have their way, we have 19 years left before they have to eliminate Amalek and Esau. Well, it's a little bit more than that. I think it's more like 200 something years. But anyway, we are approaching it and they, they will do it as soon as possible. In that last 400 years, they try to accelerate things and make it worse and worse, just like uh, the bang, pangs of birth of a woman. Her contractions become more frequent and more severe as time passes. And that's what they want to have happen to the Gentiles. Getting back to the Zodiac, all of this relates to an Orphic God, Phanes Protogenes, the bringer of light and the first begotten. If you look at a picture of Phanes Protogenes, you'll see that Aries is at the peak of the Zodiac. So he's right in the middle of that. And that was the age of um, the Jews. And we are transitioning from Gemini to Aquarius. In that transition, in those six days, the sixth day is the millennium we're in, the 6,000th set of years. That is the year of work. Because the Kabbalists must rest on the seventh day, the Sabbath, they have to do all kinds of preparations on the sixth day, the day before the Sabbath, which is what we're in. That's the day that they have to work extra hard so that they can then rest on the Sabbath. They keep the Sabbath day holy because the Sabbath day represents the seventh millennium of the world to come after the old world has been destroyed by their work. And again, it's important to understand that Jews every week, uh, religious Jews, Judaeus, prepare extra hard the day before the Sabbath so that they don't do any work on the Sabbath. And that is what Kabbalists are doing increasingly so right now with Tikkun Olam. They are working extra hard to kill off the Gentiles. On this seventh day, that work will have restored the perfection of the Kabbalists and of the world by elevating them back towards the one causing an ascendance up the hierarchy of being toward unity of the light. And that is what they are cryptically referring to with Tikkun Olam and elevating the sparks and repairing the world. At the same time, they will have lifted all of the divine light away from the Gentiles so that the Gentiles will have resolved back into Tohu and Bohu, which are chaotic matter and will become nothing. They will be non-entities. They will no longer exist. 
and the world will have been perfected. Now in the seventh millennium, the Kabbalists will have slaves. In the old days, I don't think they had fully envisioned what they see today as being these cyborg, transhuman, post-gender abominations of programmable robots, cyborgs, connected to this matrix of the singularity with no soul or no will to serve as their slaves. In the old days, they envisioned that they would have 2,800 Gentiles in the seventh millennium to be their slaves, but that's no longer the plan. They're going to completely exterminate Gentiles because they have to as the process of tikkun olam, as the process of eliminating the shells, the kelephot, the klipot, they have to get rid of Gentiles in order to perfect the world, in order to do tikkun olam and elevate the light of the sparks. They do tikkun olam by observing the 613 mitzvahs, and three of those are about destroying, cutting off the seed of Amalek and the memory of Amalek. And Amalek, it's anybody that doesn't believe they're chosen, it's conflated to mean all Gentiles. It's conflated to mean Esau. They say it's a descendant of Esau and just like Esau. So so even just that, that's another example of the extermination, uh, annihilation of, of Esau and Amalek in the end times. Absolutely. And it is specified in the Zohar that Amalek is tohu and bohu, meaning material chaos. So the process by which they engage in these mitzvot is removing the light, removing knowledge from Gentiles, atomizing Gentiles like the Tower of Babel, separating Gentiles so that they cannot unite against the Kabbalists, just as they pit Christians and Muslims against one another. That is the same thing that happened with the Tower of Babel. So they are stripping Gentiles of knowledge as they themselves acquire the technology and knowledge which makes them rise the chain of being to become gods, to cross over the bridge, the deat of knowledge, from the mundane realm to the heavenly realm. Now in terms of Shabbos Goyim, Shabbos refers to Shabbat. Shabbat is a reference to the planet Saturn, the seventh heaven, the throne of God. In Chagigah, in uh, the Talmud, it specifies that God's throne is in the seventh heaven, which is the planet Saturn. That is where we get the name Saturday, Saturn's day, Kronos, Saturn. So when they hire Gentiles to do their work on Saturn's day, Saturday, the Sabbath, it is symbolic of the fact that in the Sabbath millennium, the 7,000 years, all Gentiles will be slaves. They will be able to completely rest for a thousand years in the seventh millennium. And that is why they celebrate the Sabbath and keep it holy, because it reminds them that they must enslave and destroy the Gentiles and that the Gentiles must do the work and will absolutely do all the work in the Sabbath millennium. You touch on the the scattered sparks in Kabbalah and how that's related to Adam and Eve and the exile of the Jews. Um, everyone has heard the idea that Adam fell, and we've all heard of fallen angels. The idea of the fall is this idea of the descent of getting further and further away from God as the emanations proceed down the chain of being. A much worse fall was when the vessels shattered. Um, the shattering of the vessels in uh, the most esoteric and occult beliefs of the Hasidics are transposed from this Neoplatonic belief in emanations in the sense and of uh, creation ex materia in the sense that when Adam tried to acquire knowledge and elevate himself up the hierarchy of being to become one with the one, um, it was a catastrophe. And it was the catastrophe which separated Shekinah 
from Yahweh, the androgyne of the Godhead, split as a result of Adam's uh, fall, Adam's emanation away from God by betraying God and disobeying God. Um, that is the fall. It is a lowering on the hierarchy of being. And that lowering on the hierarchy of being happened also to the gods. They went from perfect unity as an androgyne, as Yahweh Shekinah, as one androgynous God, into the differentiation, the um, particularization into two beings as two distinct genders, male and female, into Yahweh and Shekinah. And that is viewed as moving away from the perfection of the one towards the evil multiplicity of chaotic matter at the bottom rung of the hierarchy of being. So it happened to the gods as well, and it was Adam's fault. At the same time, the same thing happened to Adam. Adam was initially an androgyne. He was created in the image of the androgynous Godhead. So he was both male and female. When he tried to acquire knowledge and was tempted by the serpent to obtain knowledge so that he could become like the gods and cross over the bridge from the mundane realm to the divine realm, he fell. And when he fell, he split. He again went further away from unity into multiplicity, into differentiation. And he became male and female. He became Adam and Eve. And the uh, 600,000 souls of the Jews also differentiated into male and female half souls of their twin souls. All of that has to be rectified by the Jews so that they return back to the one, to the unity of being androgynous. And all their 600,000 souls will be contained in the Messiah and released uh, very soon, I'm afraid. The Gentiles have a different process of creation. The Gentiles are created by an entity known as Adam Belial. Adam Belial is the demon that is also an androgyne composed of the dark opposite of Yahweh and Shekinah, which are the male god, dark god of darkness, but it is Satan. It is Samael is the male aspect of Satan, and um, Lilith is the female aspect of Satan. And Samael rides the serpent Lilith in uh, the Zohar to tempt Adam in the garden and bring about the fall. When that happens, and Eve is separated from Adam, this Adam is the Adam Ahelion, the supreme man and is created by the emanation of Adam Kadmon into the Tsimtsum from the Ein Sof. There is a different creation now that happens between Eve and the serpent. And remember, the serpent is composed of the male and female elements of Samael and Lilith. This serpent visits Eve and copulates with Eve, has sex with Eve and produces the child Cain. Cain is now composed of and created ex materia from this chaotic tohu and bohu, which are Satan, Samael. So within the seed of Gentiles is this satanic seed of Satan, Samael. Samael and Lilith are Adam Belial. Belial means wicked. So they are the seed of the evil man, the wicked man, the unnecessary man, meaning the man that will be exterminated. Notice that there are more Gentiles than Jews. That is because as you descend down the chain of being, you get uh, more and more differentiation away from the one which represents greater and greater distance from God and uh, becoming closer and closer to pure evil. Pure evil is infinitely divided. It is chaotic. It is constantly changing and rearranging. 
So that is the elements that the Gentiles are composed of. So the Gentiles derive from Adam Belial, who is Satan in the form of Samael and Lilith, who are the serpent who infused their seed into Eve to produce Cain. And Cain is the ultimate father of all Gentiles and is composed of the Kelifot. The Kelifot, again, are the shells of the vessels that the Ein Sof created to uh, contain the light of its emanations into the Tsimtsum. And this again relates to the Greek conception of matter and creation ex materia. Jews are created ex Deo as the emanations of the Ein Sof divine light into the Tsimtsum. Gentiles are created ex materia as the formation of the vessels out of matter, out of evil and nothingness, to contain the light and the forms of the light, and seven of those shattered. And the shattering of the vessels occurred at the same time as the fall of Adam. And this produced the shells which became Satan, the demons, Lilith, and Samael, and the Gentiles. And they are referred to as Kelephot or Klipot and the various uh, singularities and pluralities of those terms. So I just saw somebody in the chat object and say that the Kelipot has nothing to do with Gentiles, but that it's shadows. So I just wanted to refute that real quick. And here's one way I'll do it. Gershom Sholem, he was the uh, professor of mysticism, so Kabbalah at the Hebrew University well-known scholar he says here the gentiles who were designated as esau or adam will suffer the opposite fate they receive their light in this world at a single stroke but it will depart for them from them gradually until israel shall grow strong and destroy them when the spirit of uncleanliness shall pass from the world and the divine light shall sh- shall shine upon israel without let or hindrance all things of of the the peels or the husks or the shells of darkness that's the hindrance all things will return to their proper order to the state of perfection which prevailed in the garden of eden before adam sinned in the redeemed future uncleanliness i.e the gentiles and the unfit and death will be abolished and here's one more same book lurianic kabbalah strove to inculcate in every Jew a sense of duty to elevate the sparks and to bring about the ultimate tikkun of creation. It said, um, all Gentiles are referred to as profane and kelipa, whereas Israel alone is called sacred. All the other nations are profane. So okay, one of the most... Re- just a singular form of kelipot. Exactly. So the Gentiles, Edom, Amalek, Kelipa, they're all the same thing. This is all code, and they have all these stories about how we're evil and that we have to be eliminated in the end times. And that code also relates to the idea of keeping knowledge away from the Gentiles, and it also relates to the story of the Tower of Babel, where they are speaking a language which is unintelligible to Gentiles to conceal their plans for the destruction of Gentiles. Here again it says... The last divine sparks of holiness, when the, when the shattered vessels, uh, the light and the, the vessels shattered, which fell at the time of Adam's primordial sin into the impure realm of the Kelipot, the hylic forces of evil whose wo- who's hold in the world is particularly strong among the Gentiles. Again, liking associating the Kelipot with the Gentiles. So the, the scattering of the uh, it's the light to note the phrase have not been gathered back again to their source. Yeah. So we are going from the one to the me, uh, from the many back to the one. We are ascending the hierarchy of being, which is on the back of the dollar bill, e pluribus unum, out of many one. So the Jews are being restored to the one, while the Gentiles are being scattered and destroyed to become nothingness and to descend through the gates of impurity into the realm of the Kelly pot. 
this is explained in the clip with Rabbi Leitman where he says that they are the aliens of light from another dimension that are here and have to uh, connect with one another to lift each other up. Exactly. They are higher beings. They are intermediary beings that are higher on the hierarchy of being and will become higher still as they elevate the sparks of their divine emanation. And just as Adam and Eve sinned and were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and the in the creation Kabbalah story, the shattered vessels, the light scattered, the Jews were scattered into exile and they have to return and be lifted up and return back and destroy the Gentiles. Absolutely. It is a process of losing the self to, to restore the unity of the one. Collecting the sparks of Shekinah, which is the Jews, from the Hus, the Gentiles, in which they are held captive, as in captivity and exile, by the dark power or the other, the other demonic side, which is, in Lurianic Kabbalah, is the Gentiles, the other side of the tree of life, the three satanic spheres. Better, better than the tree of life, think of the hierarchy of being. At the top, you have God. At the bottom, you have Satan. That's the real other side. And here also, Israel's exile is not a consequence of its sin at all, but it is rather part of a plan designed to bring about the destruction of the Kelly Pot all over the world. That means the extermination of the Gentiles. The kingdoms of evil, or the Gentile nations, will collapse of itself, for its existence is made possible only by the divine sparks in its midst. So the, the world only exists because of the Jews. That's... That's that teaching. See that what you said is true, but what it means in terms of what I'm explaining is that the divine sparks are like the Logoi Spermatikoi. Spermatikoi. They are um, Plato's ideal forms that have been brought down to the material of matter at the lowest rung of the hierarchy of being. And these ideal forms, though they are corrupted, create the forms that we perceive. Now, by taking away the knowledge that the Jews have, and by taking away these uh, divine sparks which scattered from the emanations when the vessel shattered, what they are doing is removing any connection to the ideal forms in the mind of God to matter. And in so doing, they are restoring matter to its primordial existence as nothing, complete chaos and void, which is nothing. So by uh, stripping Gentiles of knowledge, they are casting Gentiles into hell and non-existence. You, um, a couple times, you don't mean to, but you have referred to the Jews as the scattering of the vessels. What the Jews are, are the scattering of the sparks that occurred when the vessel shattered. The Gentiles are the scattering of the vessels. They are the materia. The Jews are the light, the divine emanation. My mistake. No problem. I'm sure that's what you intended, but... um... And then now, here's just a little bit from... Check this out. This is Tanya Part 1. The souls of the people of... By Schnord Salman, the first Rebbe. Yes, this is written by the first Chabad Lubavitch, Rabbi Schneer Zalman in 1745 or 1812, the founder of Chabad Lubavitch. Look at what he has to say. The souls of the people of the world, however, emanate from the other unclean hilly pot, which contain no good whatsoever. Okay, I guess I this refutes. See how the guy lies in the chat and says that we're wrong? Founder of Chabad confirms what we're saying. This means they want to eliminate all the Gentiles from the from the world to come. And people are going, what? why are you talking about this in the chat? They don't understand the significance and the implications of this. Well, I wish uh, they would ask questions instead of making false assertions. And um, this passage in the Tanya is also vicious and stating that everything that Gentiles do, which is actually good, is actually evil. Because Gentiles come from the other side, the opposite end of the spectrum of the hierarchy of being. So even when Gentiles do good things, which are based on the ideal forms, 
The Kabbalists call it evil because it has to be evil because it derives from the klipot, the caliphot. Uh, they believe terms. they're so sick that they believe they can do evil and it's good. But then even when Gentiles do good or charity, it's out of selfish motivations, as it says here. Quote, the kindness of the peoples is sin, that all the charity and kindness done by the people of the world, that's the nations, the goyim, is only for their self-glorification. That's what they think of us. That's a wonderful insight, Adam, that their dualism says that even when they do uh, evil, it's for ultimate good. And even when Gentiles do good, it's for ultimate evil. Which is why they like Gentile anti-Semitism more than... Um, leaders that are good to Jews, actually. At least they have in times in history. Because it keeps the Jews separate. It keeps yeah. the evil darkness away from the Kabbalists. It keeps the uncleanliness away from the Kabbalists. And here's Zalman again. Gentile souls are of a completely different and inferior order. Totally evil. No redeeming qualities whatsoever. Remember we read the same thing about Amalek and his uh, Kelly Pot? This is the evil Samael, Satan, in their view, all, all Gentiles. And this is what all the Chabad Lubavitchers say. The difference between an Israelite soul and the soul of all non-Jews is bigger than a human soul compared to an animal soul. And of course, Jews or Gentiles come from the three satanic spheres, which and the Jewish soul stems from holiness. Again, that is all distinguishing the Jews as being higher beings on the hierarchy of beings. Let's just go end with a couple of these straight from the Zohar primary source documentation. Zohar 139b, by selling Jacob his birthright, Esau became a slave. Jacob knew that for one goat that the children of Israel sacrificed on Yom Kippur to his level, he became a slave to his descendants. This isn't just symbolic of evil inclination. This means nations and descendants. That means me and you and will not accuse them. And because of the level of wisdom of Esau, Jacob dealt wisely with Esau everywhere so that Esau was unable to rule and was submissive. Jacob was not defiled by, by him, but ruled over him. And it, it, it teaches them to be uh, wolves among, or uh, what is it? Lions among sheep as well. Um, yeah, and Obadiah and Micah. Jacob looked Jacob far go through like a lion among sheep and trodden down or something like that is the line and esau is stubble that they're going to burn us as well in other verse jacob exactly. looked far ahead and saved it to the end of days where he would rule and esau would be the servant it's it's hashem hashem is the evil one according to them terry on the torah yeah and it says here jacob Put them aside for the end of days. It's all about them ruling over in the end of days. This is, uh, Jacob humbled himself before Esau so that Esau should later become a servant. Let the nations serve you and bow down to you. It was not yet time for Jacob or Jews to rule over the Gentiles. Jacob left this to happen at a later time. All of the Zohar is just about ruling over us in the end of times. And this is the, this is a new one I found. Pesachim is the Talmud. They were entitled to three matters. The Jews needed to do three things. To eradicate the descendants of Esau, to construct the temple, and to name the Moshiach. Now, and that's also found in um, Sanhedrin 20b, where it names the three things that the Jews do when they return to Palestine. They must exterminate Amalek. They must build the temple, and they must um, anoint the king. And they're confused as to what order those things should happen. Didn't you also find something, uh, Zohar 143b, that talks about the world to come? Yeah, yeah, we're going to end we'll end on that one right now. But just, I wanted to emphasize that usually when we hear of the, these three things happening, they associate the elimination of Amalek. So here we see that you can basically interchange Esau and Amalek. And Esau, rabbis saying that America and all Gentiles are Esau. The Christian European West is all Esau. And here they have in their Talmud... Edom is another code word. Adam, yes. That they're going to eradicate the descendants. Descendants means people. This is genocidal. Zohar 1, 143b. But at first Jacob received above only. That means the world above heaven. And Esau received below. After King Messiah, their Moshiach, will arise... 
Jacob will receive above and below, and Esau will lose everything. He will have no portion and inheritance or remembrance in the world to come. And the house of Jacob shall be fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. For Esau will lose everything, and Jacob will inherit both worlds, this world and the world to come. Remember, we were supposed to debate those Kabbalah, uh, what Kabbalah.info, the big Kabbalah website, uh, Rabbi Leitman's people. They were all enthusiastic about debating us. They're like, oh yeah, we'll debate. Funny, once they saw my debate, they didn't want to debate anymore. Because nobody has been, where have you seen people show you this many Zohar uh, sources and talk about these things and the shells and the husks of darkness and Adam belly all? Where have you heard any of this stuff? Nowhere. Is, is this not something important that people need to know about? Their planned religion to genocide the Gentiles? Absolutely, and that is why they are employing the allegory of their gods in terms of the Tower of Babel and the Garden of Eden. They are keeping Gentiles from biting of the tree of knowledge, and they are scattering and using coded language like the Tower of Babel to keep Gentiles from uniting against them and from understanding their plans. And they are so bold that they assert that all their plans to exterminate us and to kill off the human race are in fact um, altruistic. And they call yeah. Tikkun Olam the great and noble thing that Kabbalists are doing to, to bring light onto the nations. They're glamorizing Kabbalah as if that's going to be the solution to heal the world and to save the Gentiles. So they're, they're hiding, they're disguising our destruction as if they're saving us. Exactly. 